in the 19th century had few rights, but they found ways to play important roles in American politics and life. In her books, Founding Mothers and Ladies at Liberty, NPR Koki Roberts writes of influential women in early America. Now she turns her focus to the women of the Civil War era and how their energy and smarts helped shape history. Her book is titled Capital Dames, the Civil War and the Women of Washington. Koki Roberts joins me in the studio. I do invite your calls, comments, Call us on 800-433-8850. Send us an email to drshow at wamu.org. Follow us on Facebook or send us a tweet. Koki, how good to see you. Wonderful to be with you, Diane. Always a real treat. You know, I love the title of this book <laughs> because I think of James as brassy and pushy and making sure they get what they need to get well, you know, I had a terrible time with the title of the book. And um, and the book, I delivered the book very late. And uh, the publisher kept saying to me, if you just come up with a title, <laughs> it would make everybody a lot more happy. And so, and they wanted something about Washington or something about the Civil War. And I just, I was having an awful time. And finally, I switched from Washington to Capitol. And once I did that, you can, you can, it's a play on words because of course it also means first rate. Of course. And so, um, so then it just came and, uh, and they are, they are capital names. I think it's a great <laughs> title. Thank you. Tell us about the epigraph you quote. Red Cross founder, Clara Barton. Well, Clara Barton, of course, is one of the most admirable dames in this book. Uh, <clears throat> not only uh, was she the founder of the Red Cross, and by the way, Diane, don't you love how history books say things like that? And then she founded the Red Cross, like yeah. it was just, you know, a cinch, right? right? Was there some struggle that happened there? Right. But, of course, in this period during the war, she was out on the battlefields and and going through horrendous uh uh, difficulties and, and horrors that she was beholding, but loving every minute of it because she was useful and she was powerful and she uh, felt very strongly that she was doing a wonderful job. And then she went to Europe after the war, discovered the Red Cross, came back and instituted it in America. But that involved lobbying the Congress for close to 20 years to ratify the Geneva Conventions because that's what the Red Cross is part of. And, um, and those are the same Geneva Conventions we're still using of today. Of course. So, uh, and so soon after she had succeeded in that and getting the conventions ratified, she spoke uh, at a Memorial Day address. And by the way, Memorial Day was also instituted by these women uh, as a way of bringing uh, the, the warring factions back together. But she said at this Memorial Day address, woman was at least 50 years in advance of normal position, which continued peace would have assigned her. And that's really the thesis of the book, is that the war, like World War II, which you and I grew up after here in Washington and saw the effects, uh, really did change Washington dramatically, but also changed the role of women, and in very similar ways that World War II did. And I want to remind listeners, don't forget you can see Koki Roberts <laughs> on our live video stream just go to drshow.org. You'll enjoy watching as well as listening. You know, I realized as I went through this book, what an education you have given us about women who played such an important role in well, our Well, thank history. you. I appreciate that. And that has been my intention. Um, I, I feel that, you know, writing history, leaving out half of the human exactly. race is really a distorted view of history. It's not accurate. And so, uh, and it's also terrible for for any young person, but particularly a girl, to grow up thinking that women were not making tremendous contributions to the founding of the country and the continuation of the country. But tell me what interested you so much about women of this particular era. Well, the truth is the publisher really wanted a Civil War book. <laughs> 
and okay, and okay. Uh, because of the founding era, you and I have talked about it before, because I have to deal with the founding fathers so much in covering American government, uh, that got me very interested in what the women were up to. And of course, they were fabulous. But um, but the Civil War sesquicentennial today is the 150th anniversary of the death of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, had the publishers, HarperCollins, interested in uh, what were the women up to? And, and I frankly had never wanted to write a Civil War book because my ancestors were all on the losing side. Uh. <laughs> but, um, but, and then I really did have to sort of think about what it would be. And then I realized that, that if I looked at it uh, similarly to World War II, and and confined it to Washington because otherwise it's just too diffuse, oh, impossible. And so and and it just turned out to be fascinating. But you know, I think too many of us who grew up, I grew up during the Second World War, thought uh, the Civil War is made up of the Scarlet O'Hara's, right, right, rather than the women who were out there really pushing. Right. Well, Scarlett O'Hara was also a pretty tough woman, though. She was pushing, <laughs> so, absolutely. But, uh, and these women uh, in Washington, so I started in 1848 with the dedication of the Washington Monument, where we still had Dolly Madison and Eliza Hamilton. So the actual spouses of founders were still there at the dedication. So it was kind of a last moment of unity before the 1850s <laughs> started breaking the country apart. And, and during and Dolly Madison died in 1849, and she had been the central power in what Washington. What a figure oh, she had fabulous. to have been. And the, um, so the women who were here, who were kind of the, the leaders of society, were the Southern women. So they were somewhat like Scarlett O'Hara, except they were deeply, deeply, deeply political yes exactly. and uh, and they were uh, advocating for their husbands fathers brothers um they were in the halls of congress every day and they were in the white house berating presidents you can't get over the access they had to one president after another and the just sort of nerve that they had of going in and telling presidents off <laughs> <laughs> well I think about First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln and what, as you mentioned, today is the anniversary, 150th of his death. He was actually shot the night before right. and died the next morning. What she must have been like. I gather she was an extraordinarily bright. She was very bright. She was politically very savvy, but she was very tortured and probably mentally ill. From the start. Probably from the start. But, but, the but, but deaths it was, the deaths certainly contributed. But Diane, they all had deaths. That was the way life was. I'm not saying that it didn't affect them deeply. It did. You know, there's this sense that, oh, well, if women all lost children all the time, they weren't affected by it. That's crazy. But Verena Davis, for instance, her counterpart as the First Lady of the Confederacy, similarly, as Mary Lincoln had little Eddie die as a two-year-old, um, Verena had a little boy die as a two-year-old, and Mary Lincoln had Willie die in the White House. Verena Davis had her 10-year-old fall off the top of the house in Richmond while he was pre and, and died. So, you know, these women went through terrible times, and Mary Lincoln uh, had the disadvantage of going through her own tremendous grief during a war when every single family in America was going through tremendous grief. So it was very difficult for people to be all that sympathetic. And she probably took a great deal of her anger and grief out on her husband. Yes and no. It was a loving relationship. They yes. clearly did love each other. Yes. And she took plenty of her anger and grief out on members of his cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> and and they they didn't take to it kindly, and the women of Washington didn't take to her kindly, and a lot of that was prejudice because they were Southerners basically, and he was what they called a black Republican, um, but so she 
formed really close friendships with the women who worked for her. And most particularly Elizabeth Keckley, the, <laughs> the former slave who um, was a very talented dressmaker. Uh, she had worked for Verena Davis when, when uh, Mrs. Davis had been in Washington, but for all of the prominent women, she had made beautiful dresses. She had bought her own freedom and come to Washington. And so Mary Lincoln wanted the best and she hired Elizabeth Keckley and they became great confidants. So Mrs. Keckley heard um, the conversations between Abraham and Mary Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And she also, um, Mary Lincoln spoke to her about all these people and said what she thought about them. And then Elizabeth Keckley wrote a tell-all. Koki Rappers, her newest book is titled Capital Dames, The Civil War and the Women of Washington. Your calls, your comments are welcome. Stay with us. And welcome back. Koki Roberts is with me. She's got a brand new, wonderful book out. It's called Capital Dames, The Civil War and the Women of Washington. Don't forget, you can watch the program as well as listen. Go to drshow.org, click on live and see Koki Roberts in her beautiful blue jacket <laughs> matching her beautiful blue eyes. Here's an email from Sarah. She's at Penn State. She says, I teach women's history to college freshmen and sophomores. I've used your book, Ladies of Liberty, to facilitate discussion of women in leadership. This concept prizes the students right. because they imagine women had very little influence at the time. What do you think capital dames can bring to the college classroom? Even more understanding of women's influence and, and power, frankly, uh, and and their contributions. You know, that's the 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 concept is that women were sitting home, you know, pouring tea, or uh, or if they were poorer, they were cooking, or, you know, taking taking care of the children. When that was just simply not the case, and um, and in this era, what you find is. Um, the political women, again, as in Ladies of Liberty and Founding Mothers, with tremendous influence over the men and you know, on behalf of the men. But also, you see women uh, in other spheres uh, beginning to exercise their abilities. So 
uh, in World War II, we had Rosie the Riveter. Of course. And we've all been educated, finally, yes, about Rosie the Riveter. Indeed. Well, in, in the Civil War, we had women coming and working in incredibly dangerous work in the arsenals. And here in Washington, and it was only one of these tragedies, uh, there was a huge explosion at uh. the arsenal. A couple of dozen young women were killed. And uh, the newspapers of the time, and I want to come back to the newspapers, the newspapers of the time described, it was a horrible scene, they were burned up, and described yeah. their hoop skirts trapping them so that it made it hard for them to escape. Uh. And the hoops got very hot, the metal of the hoops, of all course. of that. But they were here working in arsenals, and that was true around the north. Government girls in World War II, you remember that, coming to town and coming to work Absolutely. in the government? Absolutely. Same New Washington. exact thing happened in the Civil War. Um, the Congress passed a bill allowing for the printing of paper money to finance the war, just as women were showing up in town looking for work because they needed to support themselves with the men away. And so the treasurer of the United States, General Skinner, said... Um, said, well, he would hire these women, partly because it was a lot cheaper, something we learned at NPR. Uh, and, <laughs> and the, but, but also, the, the, um, the money came off the press. It still does in these great big sheets, right? Now, of course, now it's machines that cut it into of bills. Course. Then it was women sitting with a pair what? of scissors cutting bill by book, bill out and Treasurer Skinner said the women are a whole lot better with scissors than the men. Now go back to the newspapers. So what's really exciting about writing about this period as opposed to the earlier periods is that there are now, thanks to digitization, newspapers from the early 19th century on uh. online. And, so, and the New York Times entire archive is online. And, um, but newspapers from all over the country. So you can read what they were reading in real time. The only disadvantage is they're so interesting that you can waste an enormous amount of time because the ads are all there, sure. everything. Sure. And it's just fascinating. One thing you have included in the book are numerous letters right. which have never before been published. Well, uh, some, thankfully, some letters have been published, like uh, uh, here in Washington, of course, we know well Blair House and Elizabeth Blair Lee. Uh, her father, Francis Preston Blair, was a confidant first to President Jackson, then to President uh, Lincoln. Her brother, Montgomery Blair, was in Lincoln's cabinet. Her brother, Frank Blair, was a congressman from Missouri. But her husband, Phillips Lee, wh who was a cousin of Robert E. Lee, was in the Union Navy. And so she wrote to him every day because he was always away for mm. years and years and years and years mm. and years. And some of those letters have been published in a book. And some, uh, so I have some unpublished, some right. published. Right. And that's true with Vermina Davis as well. But with some of these other people, they've never been published. And the great thing about women's letters, Diane, is that they are so much franker and fresher and funnier than the men's letters because the men were very self-aware and they knew that you know they were important people. of course and that um, and that their letters would probably be preserved and published and they edited them and they were careful and they were pompous but the women just wrote right so here's a perfect example Verena Davis Jefferson Davis's wife this is uh, uh, right after the election of 1856 and um, everybody in town, the women at this point are all vying for Chief Bell. They called themselves Bells. And, um, and, uh, but even though they're vying with each other, one they all loved was Adele Cutts. And she had no standing. She was not married. She didn't have a father who was uh, prominent. But her great aunt was Dolly Madison. Ah. And she, but she herself was just lovely. Everybody loved her. She was kind and smart and beautiful. And, um, and then suddenly she ups and marries Stephen Douglas um, right after the election of 56. And she was much younger and he had a couple of kids. Who, and, and Verena Davis just thought this was an outrage that she was marrying this old man. And, and Verena writes to her mother, the dirty speculator and party trickster. <laughs> 
broken in health by drink with his first wife's money, buys an elegant, well-bred woman because she is poor and her father is proud. And then she says she's so glad that a water system is coming to Washington. So, quote, sparing his wife's olfactories, Douglas may wash a little oftener. If he don't, his acquaintance will build larger rooms with more perfect ventilation. Oh. The man smelled bad, and oh. um, and we learned about that from the women. The men do not comment on this fact. Just <laughs> fascinating. And what I realize as I talk to you is how you have taken all this in. Oh, well, I feel like I know them all, you know. Of course. Because I've spent a huge amount of time yeah. with them. And, and also you find things where you just can't believe it, you know, that it's so interesting. Um, a friend of mine, Ann Charnley, who had worked with me on my earlier books, but has now moved away, so wasn't able to work on this one, um, happened to find at the church at the corner of Bradley and, and Wisconsin. Yeah, um, it's, it's an Episcopal, Episcopal church. Episcopal church. Yes. She, they were writing a church history. She found there a diary of the woman who owned Rosedale, which was then a farm, oh in my. a big farm. And, um, and it was from 1861. So you see the entire... Uh, un unfolding of the war and how Washington is really dan in danger because Virginia's right there and Maryland is iffy whether it's going to secede or not. And until they built the forts around the city, it was tremendously dangerous. And you see that day by day in this unpublished diary. It's They're just great finds. We've got lots of calls. Good. Let's open the phones first to... Arcana and to Faye. Hi there, Faye. You're on the air. Oh, thank you, Diane. I enjoy your programs every day. Thank you. And I would like to ask Koki about Mary Todd Lincoln. I heard on the History Channel years ago that she became a washwoman, washwoman after she was a Escorted from the capital. No, she didn't become a washwoman, but she didn't ever really have a life. Um, she tried to sell her clothes, and that became a huge scandal. And uh, she then uh, petitioned Congress constantly for a, a pension and did get a smallish one. Why is she left with virtually well, nothing? Because of her. She had spent it all, and she I was see. in great debt, and, yeah. and he did not know that. I see. And she then uh, went to Europe to escape the the press and um, and came back with her son, uh, Tad, and then he died. So now three of her four children have died. And uh, she was really unable to cope. And her oldest son, Robert, had her committed to a mental institution. No. Uh, a female lawyer, one of the few, got her out. Uh, but she really never had a real life after after the White House. How old was she when she died? She, let's see. I can tell you. It's in the uh, it's in the epilogue. Uh, she, but the this this was so sad. It tells you um, that in her death, that though fond, this is a this is an obituary. Though fond of society and brilliant company, her reign at the White House was not socially successful. Ever since the death of her husband, she has simply been a physical and mental wreck. Uh, so there you are. And I'm that sure is a age. printed that obituary? Was in the newspaper. Oh I my found gosh. that in the newspaper. Wow. So, so she did not, she didn't become a washerwoman, but she did not have a good life. Koki, one more last question about Mary Todd Lincoln. She did hold seances she in did. the White House. And at, and at the Lincoln Cottage at the Soldiers' Home. It was not unusual, however, for people at that time in history to hold seances. And there were a lot of charlatans who were mediums, uh, especially in Georgetown. It seemed to be the center of them. But uh, she was constantly trying to contact uh, the people in her life who had died. And um, and when her half-sister came to stay in the White House, which in itself was quite a story because her half-sister was the 
widow of a Confederate soldier, um, and there she is in the Lincoln White House. But um, uh, she told her sister, um, Emily, that she talked, she saw Willie at the foot of her she bed. She saw Willie. And that she talked to him in the night, and Emily was quite distressed. Ah, uh, all right. Let's go to Emily <laughs> in Clinton, New York. You're on the air. Oh, good morning. It's such a treat to talk to you because I'm a great listener. All my friends are. I went to a, a Civil War tale story at our Clinton Historical Society and learned that a lady named Sarah Rosetta Wakeman became a private in the, um, in the Army in 1860 and became Private Lion Wakeman. Right. And so her one woman's, maybe Koki has read her story. I have I read her story. She's not included in the book because she wasn't in Washington. Uh, but there, as far as we know, there were about 400 women really? who dressed as men, both sides, and um, and fought in the war. But there were probably more than that. We just we just know about about that many. And in fact, Clara Barton, after the Battle of Antietam, uh, was nursing someone, and she was called to nurse a soldier. And when she went, discovered the soldier was in fact a female. Wow! And you're listening to the Diane Rain Show. And now to Nancy in Grand Rapids, Michigan, you're on the air. Hi, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Good. Very much so. I'm a quilter with an interest uh -huh. in historic and Civil War patterns and history, so I was hoping you would recognize the contributions that women made to the war effort on both sides in the area of the home arts, because interest in quilts of this era is alive and well, believe me. I bet it is. Uh, interest in quilts in general is alive and well, yeah, which is absolutely. wonderful. Right. And um, what a great, uh, what a great revival to have abroad in the land because it is. They are so so beautiful. Uh, but I I don't really. Nobody wrote about quilting, so I in any of the letters that I read. So Isn't I that too bad yeah, it is because too bad. there were beautiful, gorgeous, absolutely beautiful spectacular, quilts and some of them some of them heartbreaking. Really? Because they tell the story. Exactly. Thanks for calling, Nancy. To Paul in Raleigh, North Carolina, you're on the air. Hey, uh, thank you for taking my call. Sure. First time caller. Thank you. And I uh, wanted to find out, I noticed that, you know, I'm uh, studying of history and everything like that. I've noticed that a lot of the first ladies and people today aren't as active and you know, they don't, they, they're more like behind the scenes. You don't even know, who, you know, some politicians who their wives are. I and mean, it used to be that a lot of the, like the first ladies would get involved in things. And it seems more likely nowadays they're not doing as much as they used to, like Eleanor Roosevelt and um, Edith Wilson and everything like that. I've noticed a change in that in the last, say, 40 years. Well, I, I would respectfully disagree. Um, but, you know, first ladies can't win. Uh, if they if they are out there doing all kinds of uh, good deeds, people say, "What's she doing?" And why? She, and Michelle Obama has faced that. People say, "Hillary Clinton." Well, of course, that. but Michelle Obama. I'm talking about fats and foods for children. All of a sudden, she gets vilified. Exactly. You know, so it's it's a hard position to be in. And actually, since um, uh, Mrs. Clinton uh, announced on Sunday, we got some data from the pollster at, at ABC News saying that there is data that shows that a woman uh, who is considered confident and a leader is also considered unfriendly and unsympathetic. So it is really, wow. it's it's a catch-22. It's a really tough position. But I, I think uh, the First Lady certainly in the White House. Laura Bush was incredibly active uh, for Afghan women, uh, for women around the world. Yeah, on this subject. On cancer? Except all of them have been quite yeah, active. Exactly. And, and most of the First Ladies of the States have as well. But, you know, I want to ask you there about Dolly Madison, mm -hmm. she was revered even as she was active. Yes, well, yes, oh, but but she had terrible press, Diane. Oh, did oh, she? Oh, I'm a, you know, then really the press did. just made it up in oh, that era. Boy. And at one point, um, 
she was accused of, of you know basically sleeping around and um, and she was considered uh, so sexually active that she had unsexed James Madison because he had no children. This is all the papers and crazy old John Randolph threatened to name names and then at one point um, uh, one of the one of the uh, Federalist newspapers wrote that uh, Thomas Jefferson had pimped her and her sisters in exchange for votes in Congress. So it's wow. never been easy. Never <laughs> been easy. Cokie Roberts' Capital Dames is the title of her newest book. We'll take a short break. More of your calls, comments when we come back. You can watch our conversation with Cokie Roberts by going to drshow.org and clicking on Watch Live. You can call us 800-433-8850. I've got so many emails here, <laughs> Cokie. Great. This is a great question. It's from Pat in Rochester, Michigan who says, with history showing us there were women with power and strength, why has it taken so long <laughs> for women in America to come to seats of power? And will we ever have a woman president? <laughs> well, we will someday have a woman we president. We will someday. Well, let's hope it's in your, yours in my lifetime. Absolutely. Um, but... Uh, you know, even with this, and this book ends with the inauguration of Ulysses S. Grant in 1869, and uh, and it, it, that came just a few weeks after the um, Women's Suffrage Party had met here um, in Washington, uh, saying, you know, this <coughs> it, men haven't done such a great job. Uh, we need to, you know, when 600,000 Americans were dead, and um, and we need to include women in, in the whole power. And of course, it it um, it took another half century exactly. for women to get the vote. In fact, here it is: the National Women's Suffrage Commission 
uh, had come to Washington just a few weeks before the inauguration, and there, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, the history of American statesmanship does not inspire me with confidence and man's capacity to govern the nation alone with justice and mercy. Huh. I think that was an understatement, and um, but it did take another 50 years, and and the answer is not complicated. People do not give up power easily. You have to work hard to get people to give up you power. Bet. And uh, this required giving up power on the part of men. And so, that takes us to a Facebook questioner wants to hear more about African American women. And there's an email from someone who wants to hear especially more about Elizabeth Keckley, the former slave. Well, Elizabeth Keckley, in addition to her work, first of all, she she was a very established businesswoman. I mean, she ran a a, a, a business. Beautiful, yeah. You know, but it was not just creation. But it was not just she. She yes. she hired people to work for her, and um, she she had a thriving business. She was considered she was considered a great artist uh, in her work, but. Um, after she wrote the tell-all book about Mary Lincoln, uh, she did lose her business because... Why did she do that? I think she was coming into her own and wanted to show that she was a person. I see. But also, uh, Mary Lincoln had not treated her well in the end. I see. Um, but she... Um, but she lost business because people started worrying she might write something like that about them, and and African Americans thought she was being disloyal to the great emancipator, and so that was a problem. But but in addition to her business uh, sense, she became aware really before almost anybody else of the tremendous difficulties of uh, the enslaved people who were escaping. And so during the war, uh, the, uh, the slaves that ran away or got to Union camps were called contraband because they were the property of the enemy and you could seize it. And uh, so she started in Washington very early a contraband society, relief society. Huh. And because she was so influential with so many prominent people, she was able to raise a good deal of money for it. And when she traveled with Mary Lincoln, she went into other um, abolitionists and, and got Got some more money raised to come back here to help because the the many 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 of the escaped uh, slaves were here and then once emancipation happened there were huge freedmen camps uh, around Washington so she became very involved in that work were there other African well American she then women? also introduced the president to Sojourner Truth and uh, what a powerful force she was, yes, and um, and really literally a powerful voice. You know, her her voice uh, carried uh, so much uh, ability to persuade uh, on the question of abolition, and then she took up suffrage as well. And Elizabeth Keckley introduced her to President Lincoln and got her, uh, you know, a, a session with him. And I think one of the most interesting things that I've read about the whole question of emancipation was in that conversation that Lincoln had with Sojourner Truth, where she said to him, um, you, you are our greatest president, and started to sort of run down the others. And he said, no, 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 no. They, they were great men too, and in their time, they did great things. And I wouldn't have been able to do this either. I wouldn't have been able to, to free the slaves if the people across the river, pointing to Virginia, had not done what they had done. It was secession that made it possible for him to, to do emancipation. Interesting. To Hassani in Syracuse, New York, you're on the air. Thank you so much, Diane. I'm a first-time caller and an almost daily listener. Oh, good. thank and you. I'm, for calling. Great. And I'm a member of my local NPR station. Excellent. Terrific. And to Cokie Roberts, I look forward to Monday mornings at 8.06 to hear your perspective. <laughs> thank you. And I have been a fan of yours since I was a teenager. I started watching you on This Week with David Brinkley. And I miss, miss, miss you and Sam Donald. Oh, well, thank you. I'll tell Sam. I love your historical perspective. And I wanted to know if you could just comment and can't wait to read your book. 
Good. Um, about influential wives of congressional members during Lincoln's presidency. Well, so that's a lot of who I write about, uh, particularly in the lead up to Lincoln's presidency, where you have um, uh, Jefferson Davis was a senator from from Mississippi, and his wife Marina Davis uh, was someone that I write a good deal about. Um, uh, there was a senator from Alabama named Clement Clay, whose wife Virginia is just utterly delightful and uh, she actually wrote a book about herself called a bell of the 50s <laughs> but then after the war became an uh, an a uh, very ardent suffragist and was on platforms with horace greeley and uh, mrs william lloyd garrison so she the people that her husband had fought bitterly before the war so uh she's delightful um sarah pryor was the wife of roger pryor who was a congressman from Virginia. Uh, Jesse Benton Fremont, one of the, the most interesting people uh, in the book, uh, was the wife of John Fremont, who is a senator from uh, California, but also um, was the first Republican nominee for president of the United States in 1856. And when he was running, she was so out front in that campaign and so much part of the campaign that the posters and banners were all Fremont and Jesse. The vice presidential huh. candidate was completely huh. forgotten. And and she was, uh, she was so uh, admired in the Republican press, and they all talked about how she could explain the platform better than anybody else, and all of that. That one of the Democratic newspapers opposing Fremont said, "Well, what they should have," and it was, it was in. The, the, you need to see the typeface to really get it. But it said, "What the, his, what his banner should say is for president," and then in little tiny letters, John C. Fremont. <laughs> Husband of Jesse Benton oh and Great Big Heaven. So, uh, so they were all very interesting women and uh, and out there. You know, I wonder whether having so committed yourself to this book, you're dreaming about <laughs> these characters. They well, must yes, permeate your they, life. They do, and uh, and also. Um, because I had had a difficult year last year, the, um, the I Indeed. was up against a, a deadline, so I was writing from three in the morning till six at night. So I really, you know, I mean, poor Steve barely saw me, and when he did, I was not lovely to behold. Oh. But, <laughs> but the uh, the women really were my whole life for a exactly. while. Exactly. All right, let's go to Sarah's Hoda, Florida. Otis, you're on the air. Uh, yes, uh, Miss Roberts. Uh, yes. My great grandma was uh, a midwife in Danville, Illinois, uh -huh. uh, back in the late eighteen uh, nineties. Mm -hmm. She gave birth to a child uh, that belonged to a uh, a woman she's friends with, who was uh, the mother. Not the it's complicated, but <laughs> the grandmother was uh, made to Miss Lincoln, uh -huh. and uh, and she told my grandma that Miss Lincoln was addicted to laudanum. And that's why she acted so bizarre and had headaches and all that kind of stuff. Well, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be that. I, I have never read that, but it would not be that surprising. Um, there was a lot of that going around at the time. Uh, doctors would prescribe it to calm people down, and uh, it was uh, laudanum. We should explain was basically an opiate, and um, sure. and uh, there that did go on. But there's no nobody writes about that, and. I would think that Elizabeth Keckley might have written about it. And there was a nurse who uh, Mary Lincoln also became quite close to who was called in to take care of Tad after Willie died. And her name was Rebecca Pomeroy. And she took care of Mary Lincoln at various times and um, might, have, might have said something if that were true. Mary Lincoln, um, her son Robert felt that uh, her her whole kind of health changed when she had a terrible carriage accident where, where the carriage had apparently been sabotaged to try to kill Lincoln and the the chassis became separated from the from the driver and she fell out and hit her head on a rock and it became infected so that could have I didn't certain, know that. yeah so that could have certainly affected Isn't her it fascinating yeah. how many people are interested in Mary Dillon I know, Lincoln. it is interesting. It is. Uh, um, and actually, I wasn't all that interested in her because I thought that, you know, we, we she was kind of done. Um, but, but 
people really are interested in her. And and I have to say, I didn't really know. I mean, I knew about Abraham Lincoln, obviously, but I didn't know him, you know, like I know him now. <laughs> because as you say, I live with these people. Yeah. And all of the men that I've written about them in the past, of course, I admire and they have great qualities, but I'm not all that fond of them. Um, I'm very fond of Abraham Lincoln at the end of this book. As have I been <laughs> all my life. Before your mother became a member of Congress, your father was a member of Congress. What did your mother do while he was a member of Congress? Well, of course, she's, she and her Ponies, as I call them, were really the inspirations for these books. Um, my mother, Lindy Boggs, uh, was married. Uh, she came to Washington at age 24 as a congressional wife. My father, Hale Boggs, having been elected from Louisiana at age 26. And um, it was before the World War II. I wasn't born yet, but she had two little babies. And um, I think about it now, you know, how hard that must have been. And before World War II, Washington was very similar to the Washington uh, of the 19th century. You still had to go calling. Absolutely. And so it was, you know, cabinet one day, Senate one day. Has, and so she was living in an apartment right over here on Connecticut Avenue. And uh, the horn honked the first day for her to go calling. And she ran down to the car. And there were Lady Bird Johnson and Pauline Gore waiting to take her around. And I saw them and, and Mrs. Ford and and all of them just do everything. They ran their the husband's campaigns, they ran the political conventions, they ran the voter registration drives, and with the African American women of Washington, they ran all the social services here. And you're listening to the Diane Ream show. And those women really transform Washington in a different way. Yes, because they were very interested in the city. And even though home was always the district, I mean, the district they came from, but, um, but they cared deeply about the city. And this was before home rule. And so they, they worked uh, with, as I say, the African-American women here, and they did family and child services. They did everything. And then when home rule started, they were very active in promoting that. Koki, you mentioned that you've had a rough year. Not only did Steve Roberts' twin brother die, but your own brother right died as well. And both dropped dead, but and very with both totally surprising. Yes. Um, but going back to your mother and the death of your father, how old were you at the time? I was in my late twenties. I had a couple of children. I lived in California and um but I was a grown up, you know. We were grown ups in our twenties then, <laughs> you, you know. Bet. And uh, you, you know, bet. now it always amuses me that a a a, a child can stay on their parents' insurance to their twenty six. Twenty six. When you were twenty six, we had children, Absolutely. a couple of them. Yeah. But um, so, but it was it was of course an incredibly shocking thing. A plane was lost and never found, and still never been found. But my mother then, um, there was no question in anyone's mind that my mother should run for that seat. Uh, because when my father went into the leadership, he became whip and then majority leader. She really ran the district office and, and everybody knew her and, um, and she knew the district better than anybody. My sister, who was a politician as well, said to her, you know, mom, the hardest thing you're going to find is having to vote because everybody always thought she was on their side no matter <laughs> what. <laughs> but Mrs. Johnson said to her, and they were very close friends, when Mama called um, Mrs. Johnson to say that she was going to run, a uh, ladybird said, well, Lindy, I think that's grand, but how are you going to do it without a wife? <laughs> oh, how wonderful. You know, I still remember that image of your mother right with, with the, the baby yeah, on her with hip. the baby on the hip and, and stirring the, the yeah, and cooking exactly. for 1500 people for my wedding exactly yes i yes. cannot believe how she accomplished i know but you that. know they all were like that i mean i had the great honor 
of being asked to Mrs. Ford, Betty Ford, to deliver one of the eulogies at her funeral. And um, and really, I always joke that I would have been terrified, except she told me exactly what to say, and that is true. And uh, But she wanted me to talk about a time in Washington when everybody was friends, mm -hmm. and they all did work together for Common Cause. And would that we had that time again. Cokie Roberts, one of my favorite human beings in the world. She is with both NPR and ABC. Her new book is titled Capital Dames, The Civil War and the Women of Washington. Congratulations. Thank you, Diana. Cokie. Thank you so much for having me here today. It was a my real treat. My pleasure. And thanks all for listening. I'm Diane Ring. The Diane Reem Show, produced by Sandra Pinkert, Denise Couture.